Thanks for joining us. Now, as you've probably already heard, more than 1,000 Boko Haram terrorists, many of them uh, senior commanders, have surrendered to the Nigerian army. The surrender reportedly came after sustained military land and air bombardments of their enclaves and hideouts in Operation Hadinkai. An army spokesman said more arms and ammunition were also recovered from the terrorists. But does this surrender mean the threat of Boko Haram has been largely diminished? Is the Nigerian military finally winning this long protracted war against terrorism? And what about that splinter group, ISWAP, which is growing in power and influence? Is it merely a case of cutting off one head and another growing in its place? Well, to answer these questions, I have on the line Senator Aline Dume, who is the chairman of the Senate Committee on the Army. And with me right here in the studio is security expert and a former spokesman of the Army Brigade, uh, well, of the Army, uh, his Brigadier General uh, Sadi Usman. Thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. Uh, no better persons to be speaking on this particular issue than uh, both of you. Let me begin with Senator Ali Ndume, who is joining us remotely. Uh, of course, uh, Ch Senate Chairman on the Army. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, let me ask you this very fundamental question. Are we winning the war on insurgency? Is that what is playing out here? I mean, since May that uh, Abubakar Shekau, the notorious leader of the Boko Haram, was taken out or better still, uh, killed. It seems uh, there is some kind of uh, battle fatigue going on. Are we winning this war? Yes, the answer is definitely yes. And um, this is a welcome development, actually. And we are expected, uh, the army is expected to do that uh, uh, in view of the fact that uh, we're almost all what they need has been given to them in terms of finance and the equipment and other platform that they require in order to prosecute the war uh, is uh, started arriving and they have taken delivery of most of them. The number has gone up. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this development is, is, is welcome one, especially uh, because of how it has affected and uh, tortured our people for a very long time. Uh, so we can say that we are winning the war and but it's not over yet until it's all over let me uh, ask um <laughs> sunny usman here uh it's not over yet until it's over uh, as far as um senator alin dume is concerned it's not yet uhuru but what would you say i mean some are rejoicing and saying look it's looking good it looks like we are winning this war is that what you think yeah thank you very much for having me on your program uh i think um uh, the distinguished senator, just like you rightly said, is a welcome development. And of course, there is no doubt about the fact that we are winning the war against terrorism and insurgency in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, what people do not understand that uh, these uh, unprecedented developments that we are witnessing are uh, a result of uh, hard work, dedication, and extreme commitment on the part of the military. Uh, to ensure that uh, the mandate given to them to decisively deal with uh, uh, these terrorists in terms of the counter-insurgency and counter-terrorism efforts uh, mm -hmm. is paying the right di uh, dividends. And um, as you can see, beyond the surrendering, there were also other operational successes of the military beyond even the issue of terrorism and insurgency, mm -hmm. uh, some part of the Northwest and what have you. And be, uh, what, what I want you to understand again uh, is this development is a culmination of uh, almost three years effort, you know, okay. underground effort. You know, mm. over time there is this kind of um, uh, image of the Nigerian military and the Nigerian society, you know, human rights abuses and what have you. And they have consistently be telling people that they are operating within the ambits of the uh, you know rules of engagement and best in uh, international you know uh, mm -hmm. best practices now that image is beginning to shift then one other okay. contributing factor is the fact that uh, 
there is renewed synergy of efforts not just among the armed forces of nigeria but within the component of the you know security architecture of the country mm -hmm. and gradually nigerians that were sitting on the fence before realized that, it, that actually this uh, security challenges that we've been experiencing is it manifest in terrorism and insurgency and what a few uh, affects everyone therefore there is need to continue to support the military so people are forthcoming with more information mm -hmm. people are more supportive people are more understanding given the fact that uh, the military are doing what they can and okay. one other important factor yes. again uh, is the issue of good governance there okay. is a new uh, you know kind of sense of belonging and sense of hope in the northeast better than it was before so this and many more and of the fact that also there were ongoing talks mm -hmm. you know reaching out to the commanders that look unlike the propaganda you know their leaders used to tell them that once you come out you'll be killed they have been treated humanly i could remember okay. those who started coming out from Burma and all the rest they were treated humanly based on international best practices. Let me bring in the distinguished senator. Since you talk about these uh, commanders, we, we hear, uh, Senator, that um, two of the 300 or so uh, Boko Haram members are the top commanders of uh, the Boko Haram, the chief uh, bomb expert, Musa, uh, well known as Musa Abuja, and uh, of course the second in command, Usman Adamu, uh, you have been known, uh, Senator, to, uh, ha you know, have expressed your reservations about the idea of, uh, you know, giving amnesty or, uh, you know, providing some kind of uh, safe corridor for the so-called repentant, you know, terrorists. Do you still hold that view? Because you've asked the question, what happens to the victims of Boko Haram and ISWAP? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? And... Um, are you confident that these people will not go back and take up arms against the nation or against the state? Well, let me, uh, first of all, this is the first time I've, been, I've seen uh, uh, Brigadier General Sani on uh, TV. You are looking good after the retirement. Uh, it seems you are enjoying your retirement. Having said that, I, my position uh, has not changed, actually on the issue of the Boko Haram fighters that have surrendered. It's a welcome development that must be treated with extreme caution. And that is to say, it is normal in a war like this or in a situation like this, uh, the perpetrators are given the window to surrender. <clears throat> but that is not to say that the government will just embrace them, pamper them, more than even the victims that are still scattered all over the country and in various camps. And then many, many of uh, people have been orphaned, uh, children have been killed, mothers lost their, their, their children and their husbands, lost their wives, wives lost their, and then you take these people in, welcome them just because you want to end uh, the system. That is, that is totally unacceptable. But it is also the normal practice for you to have like prisoners of war and due process must be followed in order to uh, not to escalate or even create more problem. Uh, as I said, the victims are still there. They are still watching. I can hear some of them crying out that why should the government be pampering? But uh, the new system, it seems, is just taking them in. They should be taken in. They, they, they should be taken to a particular place. Uh, then they should be profiled, uh, profiled properly and uh, uh, they should also be investigated. Uh, for example, anybody that confesses is just like somebody uh, who surrenders and says, I've killed 30 people. And they say, oh, you're not going to kill them again? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, I've surrendered. I'm not going to. Then you, you set him free. It doesn't go that way. Uh, if a person confesses to a crime, then... <clears throat> Justice will be tempered with mercy and it should be treated as such. And I think that is what the military has come out to say, that it is not just like when you surrender, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are taken back into your society 
or pampered as uh, we have seen the situation where I really objected, just bringing in these people without reconciling them, without uh, resettling the, their victims, and then you start uh, re resettling those that have perpetrated the crime. Uh, that is not what we are expecting. And I, I, I'm sure the military knows what it, it should do because there is a procedure. Uh, when, uh, when, when, when a situation like this comes up, and people surrender, they should be taken in, profiled properly. Those that are supposed to um, be prosecuted should be prosecuted. There are some of them that have been conscript, and if they are thoroughly investigated, then they will be rehabilitated. And then another important thing is for the government to start thinking about reconciling, reconciliation between the victims and uh, those that perpetrated those crimes. I remember last time they had uh, a good number and some of them are from my local government. I was the one that laid the objection that they can't just bring them into our society like that without reconciling. You can imagine if somebody killed your father and you know that he killed your father just because he surrenders. Government takes him in, rehabilitate him, and then uh, give him a starter pack uh, like money or, or, or a start of capital to come back to your society. Uh, to start uh, his life, uh, that 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 is not that is not going to be acceptable. Very quickly, before we go on this break, based on what you've said, I take it then, uh, distinguished senator, that you think that to a large extent, these people should be treated as criminals and not just uh, you know giving them palliatives in the name of uh, reintegrating them uh, based on their repentance. Is that what you're saying? They should be dealt with as criminals. No, no, that is not what I'm saying. Uh, you shouldn't, they, I, I object to blanket amnesty, and I also object to just blanketly criminalizing those that have surrendered. As I said, some of them were forcefully conscript, uh, conscript into uh, the, 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 the so-called Boko Haram because uh, they have been um, a, a kind of uh, confused by the preachings or the misinterpretation of the philosophy or whatever they are pursuing in the name of religion. So those of them, through investigation, we have uh, military intelligent uh, experience, military officers or intelligence officers or investigation officers that can find out what is the status of these people. All right, those Senator Ndume, we'll put you on hold. And of course, uh, retired Brigadier General uh, right here in the studio. Uh, apparently, the military will have a lot of sifting to do, you know, of crim criminals and those that are not. You're watching the Rise interview. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue the conversation on how the Nigerian army is handling the shocking surrender of Boko Haram insurgents. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. My guests, uh, Senator Alin Dume, uh, he is the chairman, Senate Committee on the Army. He joins us remotely. And my guest here yeah, in the studio is uh, Sani Usman, Brig Brigadier General uh, Sani Usman, former Army spokesman. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, staying uh, with us. Well, terrorist organization Boko Haram has been a proverbial thorn in Nigeria's side since its formation in 2002. Uh, for more than a decade, the country has waged a deadly war on insurgency, resulting in the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. When Boko Haram's insurgency was at its peak in the mid-2010s, it was considered as one of the world's deadliest terrorist groups in terms of the number of people it killed. But with the death of leader Abubakar Shekau earlier this year, the group has seen its influence weaken, raising hopes that Nigeria's war with Boko Haram could be nearing an end finally. Uh, like I told you, my guests are still very much with me in the studio. Let me uh, start with you on this leg. Um, there's the concern of growing strength of ISWAP, because after all, ISWAP, the uh, opposing group to Boko Haram uh, was actually the group that took uh, Shekau out. It wasn't necessarily the Nigerian army. Are you concerned that ISWAP may be gaining grounds or maybe gaining uh, some strength? And I'd also like you to address that point that was raised uh, by the senator. 
about not, you know, uh, blanketly uh, calling the Boko Haram repentants criminals, it will be a tough sifting, wouldn't it be? Maybe you'll help us walk, walk us through the process of, you know, uh, reforming these people and getting them back into society. But let's talk about ISWAP. Well, first. I don't think so. And um, earlier on, we have been discussing the reason behind this uh, sudden surrender. We talked about the new synergy and jointness in terms of operation among the armed forces and the various security uh, you know, agencies in the country and of course the renewed uh, uh, buy-in of the Nigerian society as well as improved gov uh, good governance in the North East generally mm -hmm. that give people hope and sense of belonging and the fact that uh, the uh, image of the military being, uh, you know, involved in human rights abuse and yes, that's the point you have made very, yeah, very exactly. Clearly, so, but, but most importantly, I'm coming to that okay. issue. Yeah. Now, apart from that also, you know there is a contention between uh, the Shekau faction of the Boko Haram and the Iswa faction to the point that Shekau was taken out, as you rightly said. But mm. this also has created leadership prog um, problem among the Shekau you know, followers, there is this kind of distantment and general uncertainty. So they are faced, uh, you know, between the devil and the deep blue sea. So they decided that given the fact that uh, this information that they had been toying with among themselves about the fact that Nigerian military will not just kill you as soon as you come out, mm -hmm. there are procedures, there are processes, and it has started paying off. Of course, remember, there is this operation safe corridor that they have in yes. Gombe State. Some of uh, you know those that surrendered earlier on were used to talk to their contemporaries because they have the means of communicating to them so that they understand that it's against the propaganda they are in in the various camps of the Boko Haram terrorists that the future is bright and there are better prospects as compared to that. So you're now, saying you're saying in effect that the this surrender of the one thousand and others who have surrendered, including in Cameroon, Cameroon has yeah, actually exactly. reported, that is, they I reported that, you know, where uh, Nigerian Boko Haram members are surrendering. Are you saying that in the nearest future we will begin to see the you know value or positive impact on the war against terrorism exactly that's okay. where i'm heading to and that is why i'm saying beyond the nigerian shores and mm. what i want you to understand again almost the largest number of those surrendering they belong to shekau's faction mm. that does not mean that there are no iswaps among them the key commanders they are now beginning to see the light based on these factors that I've said. And more so now, they are faced with the fact that there is so much hunger and deprivation in the various camps. So remember, even way back some three, four years back, even if you kill a Boko Haram terrorist, by the time you just, uh, you know, pierce the body, there was no blood. They live on, you know, leaves and what have you. But somehow, because of the extent of coercion mm -hmm. and propaganda, they don't want. Now there is an alternative, a kind of window of, of, of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think it is good. I think it is also depleting not that of just, uh, you know, the Boko Haram, you yeah. know, come, but even that of Iswa. Okay. What we should do mm -hmm. is to take advantage of it and continue with all these processes that we are doing to ensure. Because the end of it all, we want peace in Nigeria and our neighboring countries. And that is why this surrendering is not just in Nigeria alone. I was made to understand we have them in uh, Chad, yeah. we have them in uh, Cameroon. Cameroon and Niger yeah. Republic. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a good development and I think it's a step in the right direction that we need to catch on and continue to build on it. Okay, great. Uh, let me uh, go back to the senator. Uh, senator Ndume, we, we do know, based on what France announced not too long ago, that they will actually be drawing down uh, troops uh, in Mali and basically the Sahel region. There is a growing ISWAP uh, concern based on the fact that ISWAP seems to be gaining a lot of ground. How do you think uh, ISWAP can effectively be pushed back? Well, <clears throat> well, the, all the, the government around the affected uh, countries need to do is to brace up on their, <clears throat> their military capabilities. 
uh, the war with these insurgents, whether Iswab or Boko Haram, is not a sophisticated war. There is this uh, common saying in Hausa that um, uh, you deal with the criminal within and not inviting an outsider. And that is to say our youths and the army of, especially Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, Mali itself, Niger, I believe have the capacity to handle uh, these uh, local insurgents. All they need is to have <clears throat> the arms, the ammunition, and uh, the platform requires. We are not fighting from uh, army to army, but these are, you know, uh, I can say common criminals oh. that are not properly trained, unlike the armed forces of the various countries that are properly trained to handle various situations. If their number is increased and they are equipped adequately and they are adequately motivated, we don't need foreigners to handle our okay. uh, all these buildings. All right, let me ma make this point very quickly before uh, I come back to uh, Brigadier General here in the studio. Well, the army actually says it has no plans of uh, freeing uh, this repentant uh, terrorist. And I'm wondering what then will the army be doing with them after they have been, you know, debriefed and reformed and all of that. And then on the other hand, again, you hear about uh, reintegration, uh, you know, rehabilitation, reintegration of the repentant uh, terrorists. I is the military being economical? with the true picture of things because people are worried if those people are you know uh, allowed back or integrated back into society they may uh, you know consist another threat on a different level okay well uh, well what i can say is that the military is doing the right thing and it is not every information that is available to the military that you put up on arise tv or in the public. As I said, the military knows what it will do, and it has said it. You just don't have somebody surrender, and then you, you embrace him, and then take him to his uh, family or his abandoned uh, place. No, they take them through a process. I know that they have facilities in the country. One is in Gombe, the other one is in Kainji, and in fact, they have special courts that will try them. I know that some of them have been sentenced, and I know that some of them have been freed. And I think that is the right uh, thing to do, not to say that uh, once they surrender, you just take them in. <laughs> and that Thank means you. you are telling every criminal to go and uh, commit crime. And uh, he Great surrenders. Great point. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Aline Dume, Chairman Senate Committee, for joining us. Sunny Usman, uh, retired Brigadier General, it would have been nice to get your last point on that, but we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for your insights.